Okay, now time passed uh, very quickly. We are already sort of behind schedule. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, all f five excellent speakers to uh, come, to, come onto the stage, uh, uh, take the seat, and uh, open the, uh, the floor for questions. So is there any burning questions uh, you would like to ask uh, our speakers? Testing, testing, testing. From the uh, uh, medical testing, doctor, testing, China testing, perspective, testing, Hong Kong testing, perspective, testing, and testing, as well as testing. the U.S. perspective. Testing, one, yeah. two, three. Can you hear me? Testing, yeah. one, two, three. Yeah. One. I would like to ask uh, the EPA person, now that you have a new person in charge that was appointed by Donald Trump, who's like a, a climate change denier, how has that changed your role in government? So, so uh, what what is what is the specific question of, of how it changes our role? I mean, uh, has it affected what you're doing at all? So, right now, I, I I guess what I would probably refer you to is EPA just and I I could send this as follow up information. EPA just put out a strategic uh, research plan, a strategic plan that's for our next five years. Um, and what the administrator of EPA is currently focusing on as priorities um, is, is air quality is a significant priority uh, from a scientific perspective, looking at future air quality. We are always considering what are all the variables that are predicting future air quality. So um, we are continuing, I would say, to have a very strong scientific program. Uh, but like what happens with every administration change, we do have new directions and new priorities. Um, so I'd probably refer you to that document to look at what EPA's, it's out there for public comment. Uh, and so you're welcome to comment on it if, if you'd like to see it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, there's another question with that pool teacher gentleman. Thank um, Edward Lee. Uh, thanks for the, uh, all the speakers. Uh, I have uh, understand that underst uh, some of you have told me that um, the air monitoring station in Hong Kong is not a true representative of the uh, actual pollution, particularly for those hot spot or area uh, with a highly polluted district, uh, like uh, those uh, places in, in the west, western side of Hong Kong. Uh, Yama Day, very polluted with a uh, massive uh, transport system uh, like Central Kowloon Wood, uh, uh, expat train, all located in there. And more and more vehicles are coming to the district. But there's low policy or low control on the massive construction of traffic, uh, uh, low control on the emission from these, uh, those districts. Uh, another point is that. Uh, whatever measure we have done to control uh, traffic pollution, the increase in vehicles and in recent year, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that would have a large burden on the on our air quality. Uh, the government did not make any effort to, I mean, to regulate the growth of car. And then um, the third point is that there's low enforcement on the AIO, even if the, we do have a, uh, a standard, air quality standard, there's no true enforcement, only a guideline, particularly for, for uh, public work and large-scale uh, large uh, traffic project. They do not follow, and we are always suffering, particularly in Yama Day, we are suffering uh, f uh, from the poor air quality uh, without truly enforcing the, the current air quality standard. Um, uh, I mean, uh, what we can do to um, regulate those uh, uh, hotspots, particular facing serious pollution in Western District? Yes, maybe. Uh, well, I, I don't think I can answer for the government, but I, I want to make one point. Yes, uh, we are not saying the, the government measurement, uh, because all the, like the individual station, 
they measure for a specific purpose. So it's uh, like just like many other, uh, a lot of the plan which like the set up location uh, of the air monitoring by the government has been uh, really for measuring overall averages because that gives an indication uh, of the population exposure. And I think there's a lot of study in the US uh, using similar type of measurement. But definitely, at a hot spot, uh, in, in there are uh, location of hot spot which has concentration probably higher than those measurements. Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, the other thing about uh, the increasing number of cars versus the uh, control of emission, uh, I think like what I saw in my slides, that uh, in recent years, the government has put out a lot of effort in terms of reducing NOx uh, PM emission. And there has been some, particularly for uh, NOx, which is a very key pollutant, uh, there's significant improvement in Hong Kong in the past uh, few years. And uh, similarly for PM, uh, if we look into air toxics, which is the which part of the uh, PM, which uh, is particularly poisonous or toxic, uh, the elemental carbon see a significant decrease in the past few years, also because of similar effort. But certainly, I think the government need to go and further refine their understanding and work more to uh, improve its uh, information. Uh, so that's what I can say. Is there any like to come on the? I just want to add one personal exposure. One, yeah, one one brief comment on the uh, on the air quality monitoring. As Alexis said, the you know the central site monitors, the fixed site monitors are located for specific reasons, um, and and although they don't necessarily represent the magnitude of concentration at a hot spot or a micro environment, um, they are often correlated with those concentrations. So if you have an increase in concentration at a central monitor nearby, say even in the MTR station or the train, there tends to be a, a change that moves in that same direction because the microenvironments are ventilated with some of that same air. So those monitors still give us, actually we're relying on that in our modeling, is to look at, you know, to predict microenvironmental concentrations. We, we want to do it more accurately for the absolute concentration, but it does, it does vary uh, to some extent with what's going on outdoors as well. So there's a relationship between those. Um, and I guess just to also echo what Alexis said, that on the growth of vehicle miles traveled or the vehicle fleet, um, in the US what we've seen is as, as newer vehicles enter the fleet and older vehicles leave the fleet, even though we have more miles traveled, we have much lower emissions of, of nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, diesel particles. Uh, so it depends critically on what are the emission standards for the new vehicles coming in. And Hong Kong has a relatively new vehicle fleet. Uh, and so I think Hong Kong's in a good position to have you know, low emissions as new vehicles enter the fleet, even with more VMT. There may be other issues related to that. As you mentioned, like construction of facilities, that's a whole different issue. Yes. Hello, hello. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a question for Christopher. Uh, in the US, you mentioned that there is a push for, uh, again, sustainability or uh, for maybe uh, not linking uh, correlation and causation. Um, I is it only that, or is it, or do you see also studies financed, let's say, by maybe oil companies or else, same to, to push against that, same as there was against tobacco, tobacco companies against the yeah, that's a very good question, and, and I, since I'm not affiliated with the EPA or the federal government, I can, I can speak my mind on that issue. <laughs> um, there, there are definitely stakeholder communities in the United States who have a predetermined policy position they want to see, uh, and they will honestly say or do anything to push that policy agenda, even if it's completely in contradiction to science. 
Um, and I think we're seeing a lot more of that. You're right, in the US, we had the tobacco industry and paid uh, denialists who basically lied and obfuscated. And we're seeing something similar on climate science, to be perfectly honest. We're seeing something similar on health science uh, related to air pollution. There's, there's There are stakeholders who um, are just very interested in providing disinformation and misleading the public and, and, and basically lying. Um, having said that, I mean, my experience to date has been that um, the you know EPA staff I've worked with, the external scientists I work with, that hasn't affected us to this point. And I think we've had a very objective basis for science review and policy making for air quality standards. Um, but I think there is some threat to that right now in the US. But if I could turn it around a bit, you know, having just come from the meeting in Guangzhou that Xi Bing summarized and, and having uh, worked in Hong Kong for a number of years, um, I'm also very impressed by the, the keen interest in having accurate science for policy making in Hong Kong and in China, and, and I'm not seeing that here. So, uh, you know, this, I'm not seeing the, the denialism here. And I think that's very positive and uh, speaks very well of both the science and policy communities in China and here in Hong Kong that um, you know, I think there is a common interest in objective science. And so here and right now, you know, I think that that should be our focus. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank, you very, thank you very much for this. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, presentation it was very nice I think one point that may be missing when it comes to the future of uh, delivering things to the policymakers uh, then it it's uh, is the chemical composition mm -hmm. of the PM 2.5 because PM 2.5 is quite complex and I think that mean it needs to be somehow uh, sort of delivered to policymakers I mean both when it comes to composition but also the ultra fine particle uh, formation and that is also going from the personal exposure because I mean Particles in the metro is quite different compared to particles on the countryside or in an office or, or, or somewhere else. And they have different health effects, even if we maybe not know what is the sort of causal. And I think maybe the same positive development of the, the composition, I would say, because I suppose soot particles has gone down, uh, sulfate particles has gone down, but maybe the relative nitrate particles is maybe more uh, higher. So that is maybe comments from... Yeah, I don't know who, who wants Come to on take the lead on that. Yeah, I'll just I'll say briefly, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. And I think even maybe a little to refine your statement, the, the particle chemical composition is highly complex, but it's also a function of particle size. So when we talk about PM 2.5, the, the fraction of PM 2.5 that penetrates indoors tends to be the smaller size within PM 2.5, and that has a different chemical composition than, say, your average PM 2.5 outdoors. So there can be some difference in the chemical composition of what you're exposed to indoors versus outdoors. I think one of the challenges in linking that to health effects, and, and we faced this in the last science review for the PM standard in the U.S., is there just hasn't yet been, and this may be changing, there hasn't been yet enough epidemiologic study to really tease out, you know, what portion of the health effects are from sulfate versus black carbon, et cetera. Um, but I think the state of that science is advancing, and, you know, I would imagine, I don't know when, whether it's five or 10 years or 20 years from now, we may be able to differentiate those effects uh, with a fair amount of confidence. So, that, yeah, it's, it's a very important point that you make. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I, sorry. I, I just had a quick uh, comment to make on that, too, just as a follow-up to when I was talking about gaps in sensors. I don't think sensors are going to help us on that because right now that is a major gap and technology is doing really anything beyond a indicative PM two, total PM 2.5. And so a, a lot of the advancement in research and development is still going to have to use more traditional measurement techniques that won't be able to be done at an extremely high density. 
Okay, maybe I take two questions simultaneously before the, uh, the speaker answers their questions. So, uh, gentlemen, over okay, there. Yeah, I have a question for, a, a broad question, and I'd like to hear the thoughts from all of the speakers, actually. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, I work at Business and Environment Council, where we uh, work with the private sector to uh, promote the environmental agenda. Now, my question is, you know, what can be done further to build the, di build the business case to improve air quality? Uh, this and I like to, this may be in the form of you know some new policy ideas, some new emerging trends or technologies. Uh, but you know what 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 are some ideas for the next step? What can be done further? Okay, so one more question from. Oh, I have two questions for Professor Christopher. As you have mentioned, that some air quality quality uh, monitoring network set in uh, in popular way in Hong Kong, like the Yunlong that the network set in the top of the building. So uh, which places to, to will you advise to the Hong Kong government to set the network in different places? And indeed, uh, what, why it is so important to set the network nearby the resident where they live? And why it is so important to set beside them? OK, so maybe I take one more over, over there before. Yeah, the, the lady over there, the, the corner. I just have a question to Gail regarding the uh, sensor uh, data analysis platforms. Uh, how, how do you see the future of these uh, data platforms in urban environments? I mean, this is not only air, it's also soil pollution or water. So there will be much more data coming from the citizens and from communities. How do you see the future of these, um, the reliance and the quality of these kind of data collections? Thanks. Okay, let us send out the first question first, the uh, business case. Well. I I would not. Uh, I, I will follow on what uh, Ji Bang has finished up talking. Uh, actually, if you look at China's uh, direction, it's very clear. The environmental protection, uh, strengthening of uh, improvement of overall uh, health and environmental aspect of uh, China is a very clear direction for company who doesn't see that, and uh, it's very difficult for us to further convince them. But for, for companies who really are looking at that direction, I think this would already be a very good business case because uh, it's also part of uh, whether you can continue to work uh, in China or not. But beyond that, I think developing new technology as well as new devices like uh, the sensor technology is one good example. If you can uh, develop a good sensor, there's a lot of business. Uh, just look at how many people want those things now. Uh, so there, I, I can see that uh, improvement in environmental information, uh, improvement of absolute quality of life are really things that everyone wants. So working in those direction, I think, has a lot of business case. Uh, I just want to go back one, I know the time is very tight, but I want to uh, follow up on Matt's uh, question, yes, of uh, the speciation. On this point, I actually want to say Hong Kong is lagging behind because in the last meeting, in the last few days, looking at what type of measurement the Chinese scientists are using to measure the air quality in China, uh, I'm sorry to say to our EPD colleagues here that we don't have that many in Hong Kong. We really think that going into that direction, understanding, uh, we understand those are not citizen science. That really needs a governmental uh, state of the art science to understand those composition, but those are the key information. Okay, gap. so this is a government job. So uh, <laughs> let us, uh, yet again, it's a government job, but uh, where should they put their monitoring stations? Yeah, so I, um, it's, a, it's a great question. and. You know, part of the reason why uh, some of the monitors are cited as they are, are they're intended to be general stations that are not directly influenced by, say, road sources. So they're trying to get an idea of the general air quality over a large area. So I don't mean to imply that there's anything inappropriate about those general sites. They're, they're cited for a reason. Uh, and, and another, you know, aspect of the ver vertical height of these sites that's interesting is, you know, Hong Kong is a very three-dimensional city, as we all know. And uh, one of the things that we're looking at in the Praise Project is, 
you know, how air quality differs at street level versus the 10th floor, the 20th floor, the 50th floor, uh, you know, in residential high-rise buildings and office buildings. Uh, and so having air quality at different elevations is actually very important data. Um, I think what we're saying is that, you know, there is variability in air quality that with only, you know, 15 or 16 monitoring sites, you, you cannot possibly represent all of that variability. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's the job of the government to measure air quality in your private environment. Um, it, you know, I think that should be your choice to want that data as an individual citizen. I think what we're looking at is, you know, can we supplement the, the regulatory monitoring network with additional measurements that let us develop a model that can predict the air quality in these different environments in a, in a way that you can use it as your personal information. Okay, other monitoring sensor other than air quality monitoring sensor, soil, water, all type of stuff. Right, yeah, and I might kind of combine the business case and, and also the, is this on? Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, on, on the business case front, which, which is co kind of combining the two, there is this, um, I think, significant growth in, in the idea of sort of smart cities and smart homes, like smart people, right? <laughs> uh, technology's really everywhere. And, uh, you know, the last two consumer electronics shows in the U.S., which happens every January in Las Vegas, um, they had, you know, prizes given to personalized air quality monitoring technologies that were developed with uh, crowdsource funding like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, and, and these companies, when they're, or these startups, when they're putting out their concept, many of them are getting funded, you know, many, you know, 200% or 300% over their target. And so I think there's a lot of interest in these type of technologies, just like people have fitness trackers. People are interested in having very personalized information, um, and so, and, and and we're also seeing, uh, you know, a, an example, a, a country that talk, came to talk to EPA recently, they were exploring putting air sensor technology in schools, uh, and they were looking at putting it in thousands of schools. They haven't started yet, um, but that's, that's, you know, the type of where I think a lot of the business community is seeing this as, as a big market, a new market that hasn't existed before. And it also bridges into sort of the data side of what can you do with this data. So there's, um, you know, there's some large companies that are actually creating data products. So there's, there's sort of a whole monetized data uh, that's also sort of coming, emerging as a business. And that's really also sort of a, a different uh, paradigm than when we've been in before, where it's been more freely available government-produced uh, government data. Um, and some of them are combining both measurement data with modeling and other types of predictive statistical uh, analytics to, to give a data product that maybe would include predicted values where there was not a measurement. Um, I am not aware yet of any sort of openly available database that is multimedia that combines air and soil and water. Um, on the air front, uh, we, I know of a few organizations that are exploring having a centralized, openly available database. Um, you know, one is there's a nonprofit in the United States, the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, they have a group called the Air Sensor Work Group, and so they're creating a data standard. So that's a big issue is when you're combining data from different technologies and groups, you need to have some standardized format, and right now there is not one. And so they're, they're, they're starting with a data standard and creating a platform where that data could be received. But then they need to get people to participate and to put their data there. Um, the other one that was mentioned at the, the conference that I'm not as familiar with what all they will accept as data is uh, the World Health Organization has a, an air data platform as well. Um, and so that's, I think it was World Health Organization, am I right? Or is it UNEP? Yeah. So, so that's, an, that's another one. And, um, and, and there may be others that are emerging. Okay, so maybe I uh, reserve the last question for myself. <laughs> so maybe I like to ask some comment because quite a few speakers, uh, at least Jibing and Alex, has mentioned about the Greater Bay Area, and the the Hong Kong government are trying to have a common policy to have uh, uniform air quality standards. And uh, how do you see this uh, going to be materialized uh, in the near future? 
Uh, I think uh, it's working. Okay. It's working. Okay. Yeah, I think at the be Speak up. yeah, I think at the beginning, uh, in our scientific community, we need to get unified uh, because uh, uh, although we have this kind of tradition, this kind of collaboration needs to be strengthened. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the the administration, administration, I think uh, because you you have to use something to drive the uh, unification of this air quality management. Yeah, we want we have to highlight the importance. You have to use the word unification here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, so how how can I say harmonization? harmonization. Harmonization, okay, yeah, yeah. We need to highlight at least from the scientific point of view that uh, this kind of harmonization, harmon harmonized, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. This uh, collab uh, collaboration is is very important. Uh, yeah, I, I think probably Alexis can add something. Uh. <laughs> well, I I actually. <laughs> Well, I, I guess uh, the the vision that uh, both sides, I, I guess in terms of having better, again, better environment, better quality of life, is a wish on everywhere, not Hong, just in Hong Kong, not just in China. And uh, the success of improvement of air quality in the past uh, really is amazing. But actually, the the subsequent work is harder because we have taken care of what we can consider a uh, primary pollutant. It's things that we have a lot of experience of taking out. Uh, the ozone problem, what is called the secondary PM problem, would be a lot more difficult. And to be able to do that, we really need uh, work on both sides. Uh, a lot of the uh, studies, uh, understanding the sources, uh, all this type of thing, we need to work together. Otherwise, it will, I don't think we can expect we can have the continuous improvement like last uh, five to ten years. Yeah, so that is a collaboration requirement. And then the health aspect, because as we go uh, more and more uh, focused into improving, we need to be more and more targeted on the health outcome, not just the concentration. I think uh, there's a lot of studies suggesting not every part of the PM is equally important. How can we really reduce the part of the PM that is health significant? Those, we need a lot of collaboration with the health community and so on. So I think those uh, is regionally, uh, with more data, we can understand the question much better. So basically it's uh, regional cooperation and harmonization of the, uh, of the political uh, environment would be helpful to improve <laughs> our uh, uh, overall air quality. With that, and uh, I'm afraid I have to uh, call, it, call it a close uh, with this uh, this uh, symposium, and uh, and uh, let us give uh, a round of applause to our excellent speaker.